Let's talk um, again back to your time at the University of Auckland when you were an undergraduate majoring in physics and mathematics, double major. Um, can you describe those years, how you remember them as, as your development? I wasn't uh, the model student, shall we say. I did, have, I did have at least one year there where I sort of went off the rails a bit. My career was not, um, didn't get A's and everything. Uh, ultimately, that turned out to be one of the most amusing things about my entire career, which is that um, I was in a in a year a cohort of students who were really quite exceptional, and uh, so my couple of um, non A grades made my record sort of not look all that spectacular compared with some of my uh, fellow students. So when it came to scholarship time, you know, to go on overseas, um, there was the other guys had taken all of this, the things and there was n essentially nothing left for me, so it looked like that my career was over um, at the end of my undergraduate studies, or at least my master's. But fortunately, um, there was a guy in the department, you know him, Paul Hafner, yes. and uh, he knew about a, a Swiss government scholarship to, um, for students from specifically from New Zealand and another one for, Str for Australia. And um, I had, for a couple of other reasons, I was kind of interested in going to Geneva. There was a guy there that uh, was doing mathematical foundations of quantum mechanics, and I was, I'd read his book, and I was kind of interested in studying with him. And Paul told me about the scholarship, so I applied for that. And they were delighted because they never got anyone applying from okay. sciences before. And so I got that, and I went to, to Switzerland. And you know, my career sort of blossomed from there, I'd say. It's really incredible, isn't it? It's just, you know, who, who do you talk to? Yeah, right. So, you know, I can't say how grateful I am to, to Paul for, for that, you know, oh. without, without his intervention at that stage, as I said, my career might have been over. I was also playing rugby reasonably well. so <laughs> <laughs> While you were at uni? <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's still true that when I went to Geneva from Auckland, uh, I was began in the physics department doing my PhD, so mm -hmm. always been very close in between the two, physics and maths. Mm -hmm. um, the actual path, well, I was good at it and and I enjoyed it, and eventually people started to pay me to do it, so that's sort of how it happened. And of course, that led to you um, being um, <coughs> awarded a very prestigious award called a uh, Fields Medal. And the Fields Medal is awarded by the International Congress of Mathematicians every four years. And it is um, considered by mathematicians as an equivalent of a Nobel Prize for, for the sciences. Um, can you please describe uh, in few sentences your work that, um, that was so highly recognized? It was kind of an unusual sequence of events. I was working in a uh, definitely physics-related area, namely uh, for Neumann algebras, which is sort of the part of the mathematical background for quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Fairly abstract stuff for Neumann algebras are the, supposed to represent the observables of a physical system, and that's the mathematical model for it. And these for Neumann algebras, these algebras of observables have a lot of structure in their own right, and I was working on that structure. And I, um, I defined this uh, so-called invariant of a, uh, of a von Neumann algebra, which, well, actually of a subalgebra. You have one of these von Neumann algebras sitting inside a bigger one. And I invented this number, which describes just how much bigger the big one is than the smaller one. It's called the index. And um, what I observed was that uh, this index uh, itself is somehow quantized, just like if you have uh, the hydrogen atom, the, the um, wavelengths of the light emitted from, from a hydrogen atom are quantized. You don't just get a continuously varying uh, family of wavelengths. You get these discrete bursts. And it turns out that this index was the same. Instead of getting arbitrary number, which is sort of what von Neumann would have predicted you get these discrete bursts of uh, indices. Because of the proof of this result, there was actually a connection um, which was totally unexpected with the theory of knots. So this is real knots, just ordinary knots like the ones you tie in your shoelaces. And um, 
it turned out that because of various structure that exists in, in, in knots, when you try to braid your hair or something, because I don't have too much left to braid, <laughs> but um, if you braid your hair or the braiding that is in, in ropes, for instance, is, uh, is a structure called the braid group, and that particular structure had actually quite coincidentally um, been part of my work on the von Neumann algebras. And from that I managed to uh, discover something new in, in knot theory. So it was kind of an unusual event where some event in one part of mathematics physics actually has a non-trivial uh, impact in a completely different branch of, of mathematics and physics. And that's the kind of thing that, that you know, makes waves and people stand up and notice and so and that's sort of how it happened. How, how do you do mathematical research? I mean, what do you actually do? Do you sit down, you scratch your head? Do you go through sort of aha moments? Can you tell us a little bit about well, it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big mixture of, of hard work. You know, you, get, you, get, you, you have something that you think is true and you want to, want to prove it, figure out whether it is or find a counterexample. And, you know, and you can get really, really stuck. I mean, I, mean, I know that in my, for instance, in this work, this index for subfactors work, I think I spent at least 80% of my, of my time in that, at least 80%, trying to prove something that I thought was true and turned out to be wrong. The final, the final breakthrough in that was that what, you were, what I was trying to do was actually completely and utterly wrong. The, the truth was the opposite of it. And uh, that was the hard thing because you're trying to prove something and you try all kinds of methods, but you're sort of going in the wrong direction. The actual truth is over here, and you only get sort of forced over into that corner after a, uh, after a long time and a lot of hard work. And perseverance, no doubt. Yeah. And and then there's the, the other thing we do have these aha moments. I with the knot polynomial, it was exactly like this. So I was uh, I've been thinking about it for about three years, and. Um, I met up with Joan Berman, who was a knot theory braid person in New York, and a long discussion with her, and it was pretty depressing because it didn't seem like anything that I had done was actually going to be any use for anything. And then, <coughs> but she told me a lot of things, and one of those things just kept you know, nagging away at my brain. And then about a week afterwards, I all of a sudden I actually more or less woke up in the middle of the night, thinking, "Oh my God, that's all I have to do." I was trying to do something much harder. And, Oh, so I went downstairs, did a few calculations, and in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night, yeah, and then I wow. went back to sleep. And because of course, you have to be aware, as I'm sure you are, that most of the time when you get a great idea right before you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning and it's wrong. <laughs> right? But this is one the rare occasion it was right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, incredible feeling, I'm sure. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. It was a big high. Yeah. Mm.